Ladies and gentlemen, this session is Ingredients for Life. Here to welcome our panelists is Kanani Lee. Thank you guys all for coming and staying for this morning and day session. As we've uh, built the earth and made a core and solidified the mantle, now we have to think about the other ingredients for life as we're trying to explore habitability from the viewpoint of the Earth's interior. And so today's panel will include Bob Hazen, Sujoy Mukhopadhyay, Raj Dasgupta, Laura Schaefer, Sonia Albach, and Courtney Sprain. So with that, take it off. Hi, this is great. I'm so psyched to be here to talk about ingredients for life from the perspective of a mineralogist, which is a little bit unusual. And I have three conclusions. First of all, when we speak about the ingredients for life, we are talking about habitability. Second, planetary habitability means several different things, ranging from the most tenuous survivability of microbes that are already there to fostering life's origin. And in this most restrictive sense, in terms of origin of life, the ingredients for life must include a planet or moon with geochemical and geodynamic complexities. So I have four questions. First of all, very briefly, because I can't answer this question, what is life? Secondly, what are the minimum requirements for life's survival? Third, what are the minimum requirements for life's origin? And then relating those two, in what respects are these last two questions different? And I think they're very different questions, even though we sometimes conflate them. So what is life? Sometimes we know it when we see it. It's really obvious. Other times, at least in the surface world, we have microbial ecosystems that aren't quite so obvious, but we can certainly study them. And then I've been involved in the Deep Carbon Observatory for the last 10 years. And here we have doing a census of deep microbial life, subsurface life. And it's amazing that about 20% of Earth's biomasses could be underground. But the most astonishing statement that I've seen is that more than half of all the living cells on planet Earth are beneath the sunlit surface. And that really changes our perspective of what we mean by life and what we mean by habitability or survivability. So my second question, the minimum requirements for life's survival is really asking the full range of environments beyond Earth in which life might persist. And when we think about this question, um, th there are some number of very good papers. Tori Holer and colleagues a couple of years ago put out a paper in which they gave the uh, minimum requirements for life, and they talked about a solvent, elemental raw materials, a source of energy, clement conditions. Let's just look at those real quickly to remember what we're talking about. They said if you have an intersection of those four essential requirements, then you could have a habitable environment. And of course, the solvent, it facilitates the molecular interactions and transport of those molecules. The raw materials include carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and also probably transition elements. Those are available in pretty much any uh, terrestrial planet or moon. We have an energy source. They emphasize uh, light energy um, photosynthesis, but also redox potential energy. I want to take a brief aside and describe some work that was just recently published by Shauna Morrison and colleagues, which looked at different kinds of ways that planets create redox gradients, because I think this is a really important aspect. Life uses redox chemistry, and I think the first form of chemical reactions probably were guided by this. So on a global scale, you have differentiation of a planet, you have photodissociation of water high in the atmosphere, and hydrogen escape. You also have impact erosion. Those are large-scale planetary processes. There are also regional-scale processes, things like crystal fractionation, olivine settling as seen in the Palisades. Um, also, various kinds of fluid emissibility, including uh, silicate sulfide emissibility or silicate carbonate. Those are ways of creating regional uh, redox gradient, and on a local scale, which is probably what we're interested in in terms of origin of life, because origin of life is going to happen in a specific locality, local emissibility of fluids can do this. Meteorites, iron-bearing meteorites, can provide a really nice local redox gradient. Lightning strikes, hydrothermal veins, and also just basic photooxidation processes, for example, the conversion of siderite into hematite and that releases hydrogen. So these are all kinds of local uh, redox gradients that might provide an ingredient for life. Now, we don't often talk about ionizing radiation or various sorts of ionizing effects, but this turns out ionizing 
um, radioactivity could be very important. In our studies of subsurface life, some of these ancient ecosystems are incredibly old, um, millions or, or tens to hundreds of millions of years old, and that the only source of energy that we can really identify is radiolytic splitting of water. In such environments, microbes may take a thousand years to undergo one cell division. So it's a very different kind of survivability, if you will. And so when we talk about ingredients for life and the energy source that's required, we may have to stretch our thinking a little bit. Finally, Holler and I'll talk about the, the clement conditions, and that has to do with temperature and pH, the activity of water, protection from radiation, pressure, and so forth, and we can discuss those in detail, of course, but they're all part of this equation, then, of things that are needed for the survival of life. And I think perhaps these criteria are sufficient to sustain life, but I don't think they're sufficient for the origin of life. And so what I mean there is you think about this minimal requirement. Um, so taking a little philosophical aside, there's an observation. No one gets a PhD in origin of life. That's, you, know, you get it in chemistry or physics or geology or some other field. And as a consequence, everyone who enters this field has their own biases, especially about what constitutes ingredients for life. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something you need to recognize. So many people come into the field from the field of chemistry, especially organic chemistry. Stanley Miller was focused on carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, and what they did if you had electric sparks. And for his almost entire career, that's what he looked at. Other people think about lipid chemistry. And so Dave Diemer and uh, Luisi and others have really focused on the formation of vesicles and membrane-like structures. There's some scientists who focus on metabolism and redox chemistry, and here's where the transition elements and minerals start to come in in a very big way. And we've been looking at mineral surface chemistry, yet another aspect of chemistry that may have played important roles. But, but these are very different specialties, and they involve talking sort of at cross purposes at times. Now, we can also think about the astrophysical or the planetary science side of things, and the type of stars, the orbital parameters become very important. The idea of geomagnetism and having a magnetic field that protects you from most of the ionizing radiation. Thinking about origins and the nature of evolution of oceans and atmosphere is, of course, a very important part of this. And the whole idea about geodynamics and plate tectonics, the idea that perhaps for origin of life, you need to have a very dynamic interplay between the deep interior and the surface. And I've also been inter interested in terms of ingredients for life is just this idea of having an emergent system, the emergent complexity. So I'd like to examine these different aspects. This idea of the difference between a planet or moon that can sustain life versus the more restricted, the much more restrictive case of planets and moons that can originate life. So I'd like to, maybe there's already a terminology and I don't know it, and if somebody knows, please tell me. But I think of a habitable world as one that can sustain life, but that's different from a vital world that is capable of originating life. And so think about it this way. Planetary environments that can sustain life, that's essentially a biochemical and a biophysical problem. You have life and you're trying to sustain it. But that's different from the origin of life, which is essentially a geochemical or a geophysical problem because you don't have life yet. So it's not biology, it's, it's the, the chemistry and the physics of a planet trying to make life. So to understand these minimal requirements, to understand, we need to understand the characteristics of complex evolving systems. The origin of life essentially is a problem of a complex evolving system. And it turns out that there are three steps in any complex evolving system. First, you need to have a group of interacting particles or agents that can be arranged combinatorially in huge numbers of different patterns. So sand grains is one classic example that's very well understood. You have lots of individual sand grains. They interact through contact forces and gravity and also wind and waves acting over the surface. And the result is the emergent property of ripples and dunes and braided streams and deltas and so forth. At a larger scale, the interaction of stars in a galaxy gives you spiral arms and the central bulge and other effects that no single star can do. And, and perhaps the most extreme case is our own conscious brain where billions of neurons interact in ways that lead to consciousness, although no single neuron is conscious. So that's the first step. You need to have agents interacting. And in the origin of life, it's pretty obvious those agents are chemical, they're molecular. 
The second thing is you need to have a mechanism by which significant numbers of those configurations can be sampled. And here is a case where having a dynamic planet becomes very, very important because it's not just sufficient to have a system with lots of agents. They have to constantly shuffle around in different ways. And there are lots of ways this can happen as well. This can happen in selecting and concentrating molecules and mineral surfaces. It can happen in kind of deep volcanic environments and vents where there's lots of gradients and, and fluxes. And it can happen, of course, in sexual selection as well. These are different ways of sampling a large number of configurations. And then finally, the third requirement is you have to have a selection mechanism. Because just because you have lots of different configurations, you're not going to have any kind of evolving system unless some of those configurations are more able to function. In the case of life, there are many different important chemical and physical functions uh, which those molecules survive. So we know certainly in the Darwinian sense of natural selection, but there are many, many other kinds of selective properties. For example, people standing in line to buy tickets. So, so this kind of selection occurs all around us all the time as do these complex evolving systems. So think about what a planet gives you. If it's a dynamic planet, it has all sorts of geochemical complexities. And in a paper that Dmitry Svrijensky and I wrote almost a decade ago now, we proposed that there were five major kinds of complexification that occur on planetary systems. The gradients, temperature, um, compositional pH, cycles, day not, day night, hot, cold, wet, dry. Uh, we have fluxes of various sorts, and so you see smokers and vents at the bottom of the ocean, but also things like waves, wind, just ocean currents are fluxes. Interfaces are incredibly important. As a mineralogist, I think about the mineral interfaces, but also the surface of the ocean. Um, aerosol particles high in the atmosphere, they all have chemistry going on in interfaces. And finally, just the sheer incredible chemical complexity of a geochemical environment where you have dozens and dozens of, of different elements and trace and minor amounts that may play very critical roles in the chemistry of life's origins. So when I think about this from a mineralogical perspective, I think about the possible roles of minerals that might play, and minerals as sort of essential ingredients for life. And minerals could be catalysts, they could be scaffolds, templates to select and concentrate molecules, various kind of reactants and catalysts of that sort, and, and containers. Minerals can do all these sorts of things. And so when you think about the ingredients of life, I think the reason I was asked to be a speaker here is because I've thought about the roles of minerals and thinks of minerals as ingredients. Well, so I asked the question in 2013, what minerals would have been present during the Hidean Eon? And many of the minerals invoked in the origin of life were certainly there. Sulfide minerals are there and clay minerals, calcite, quartz, other minerals are okay. But I argued at that point that I just couldn't see any way during that early, early period that borates were around, and certainly not molybdates that required selection and concentration of elements and, and redox conditions that I didn't think were going to be present. So that was a paper that was published, and, and I said certain minerals are not available for the, as ingredients for life. And that may be true, it may be correct, it may not, but it turns out it's irrelevant. And this is a realization um, that, that came to us only in the last year or two. And the error lies in the definition of a mineral species. We, we have basically been thinking in the wrong way. When mineralogists talk about a mineral species, they're talking about an idealized end member, an ideal end member composition like SiO2, an ideal crystal structure like quartz. And when you combine those two things together, you have a mineral species. And about 5,500 mineral species out there by this definition. And I said some were present and some weren't. Okay, that may be true, as I say, but it doesn't matter. Because a fundamental property of all natural minerals is they're incredibly information rich. They have trace and minor elements by the score. They have isotopic variations. They have defects. They have inclusions, fluid and solid. All these different characteristics that makes the natural minerals quite different from the idealized end members that we talk about. And so what does this mean as in, for ingredients of life? Well, quite simply, minerals, because they incorporate all these trace and minor elements, it means that every conceivable kind of reactive surface site is available in common rocks and minerals. A basalt weathering on the ocean floor. If you need a molybdate site, well, there's a few parts per million molybdenum, and the surface sites will be there. If you need boron, in every feldspar, there's tens to hundreds parts per million boron. So 
you know, 10 out of every million surface sites is going to be a borate site. And if you need to use that for chemistry, you've got it available. And so it's really irrelevant to say whether a borate or molybdate mineral is there because the chemistry is there for you, so we're allowed to use everything. And so in terms of ingredients of life, I think this is a really good news for terrestrial planets everywhere. Okay, conclusions. Geochemical complexities are intrinsic to Earth. They're central to any model of life's origin and evolution. Therefore, among the essential ingredients of life must be dynamic and complex geochemical environments. And with that, I want to thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the talks. Thank you, Robert. Ladies and gentlemen, Sujoy Mokopadiai. The story of Earth's volatile accretion and loss is a complicated story, but today we have many more pieces of that puzzle than even a decade ago. Stanley Miller's classic experiments produced a rich array of amino acids and other interesting organic molecules that may have played a role in the origin of life. Much has been learned since the days of these classic experiments, such as we now know that the Hedean Earth was not dominated by a hydrogen methane rich atmosphere. Prebiotic chemistry in a water vapor methane or, or prebiotic chemistry in a water vapor carbon dioxide and nitrogen atmosphere is significantly more challenging than in a reducing atmosphere. So the exogenous delivery of biomolecules have also been looked into. For example, we know that carbonaceous meteorites carry a wide range of nuclear bases. And if these meteorites came in at the right time, then they might have brought in interesting molecules to have played a part in the origin of life. We can look at how the sources of volatiles have changed during the accretion of the Earth by using noble gases. These noble gases are inert, and the noble gas neon is not recycled from the Earth's atmosphere back into the interior in any significant quantities. What this means is that neon in different parts of the Earth might actually lock in a record from where they originated from. We used to think that most of the volatiles on the Earth were delivered after the moon forming impact, and that there were no memories of previous events preserved in the present day mantle. But as we look in the mantle today, we have discoveries that there are actually clues that record as to how the sources of Earth's volatiles have changed during Earth's accretion. And these clues can be disentangled by isotopic measurements such as those of neon. And these isotopic measurements reveal that neon in the Earth's deep interior was accreted from nebular gas, whereas neon in the Earth's atmosphere trace their lineage to carbonaceous meteorites. The best evidence of nebular gas in the Earth interior is actually preserved in mantle plumes, which bring material from above the core mantle boundary to the Earth's surface. The evidence of nebular neon requires proto-Earth to have grown to larger than Mars size in the presence of the nebula, to have accreted nebular gas, and to have dissolved them into a magma ocean. So the neon links the embryo phase of Earth's growth to environments such as shown in this cartoon. The shallower part of the Earth's mantle also is dominated by neon from the sun, but we are seeing evidence of gases being derived from carbonaceous meteorites. So these carbonaceous meteorites were being brought in prior to the moon forming impact. In fact, today the vast majority of the evidence points to Earth's water being derived from delivery of carbonaceous meteorite prior to the formation of the moon, which is a significant reversal in our way of thinking about it. The new measurements and analyses also point to substantial loss of volatiles. For example, the moderately volatile elements require delivery of 10 to 15 weight percent of carbonaceous meteorites prior to core formation. Yet the budget of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur, as well as the noble gases, are compatible with up to a couple percent of these uh, meteorites in the Earth, which requires massive loss of these volatiles 
The major volatiles were primarily lost to the core as well as to the space, and the noble gases were primarily lost to space. And the loss to space was accomplished by both giant impacts as well as impacts of planetesimals. As we delve into the record of the atmospheric noble gases, we're also observing surprising new information. For example, the primordial noble gases in the atmosphere is not derived from mantle outgassing, but rather from impact outgassing of planetesimal derived from carbonaceous meteorites. Because of the very large difference in isotopic composition between the meteorites and the Earth's mantle, and because the meteorites, or, or because the atmosphere dominates the budget, the meteorites must have come in after the last major equilibration between the interior and the atmosphere, which was the moon forming giant impact. But there is a problem in achieving this because elements like ruthenium, which basically trace their origin to delivery of planetesimal after the formation of the moon, suggest that it's not carbonaceous meteorites, but rather instatite chondrite-like material that are being brought in. But these meteorites do not have the, the right concentration or the right isotopic composition to explain the atmospheric neon. So we have a conundrum in terms of understanding what the volatile element signature of impactors post-dating the moon forming impact looks like. And we are unclear whether these impactors either led to addition of the atmosphere or led to atmospheric erosion, as well as these impactors might have helped or hurt with prebiotic chemistry. Thank you, Sujoy. Ladies and gentlemen, Rajdeep Dasgupta. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Today I'm going to take you guys through rocky planet formation or the magma ocean phase of uh, rocky planet's evolution to probe the question, how did we get life essential ingredients uh, from the very birth of our solar system? So if you look at the cycles of many life essential volatile elements such as carbon today, they are mostly exchanged in the near surface reservoirs between the hydrosphere, atmosphere, biosphere, and so on. But this cycle actually operates only within sort of 10 to 1,000 year time scale. But on top of that, there is another deeper cycle of many of these life essential volatile elements where the elements are exchanged between the interior reservoirs and the exospheric reservoirs in the time scales of millions to billions of years. So when we are interested in the availability of these ingredients of life at the near surface environment, we should not only be bothered by their availability at the surface, but we should be caring about their inventory in the whole Earth system into the entire non-metallic portion of the planet, that is the silicates, as well as the near surface reservoirs. So the interest that we are taking today in the geochemical community, uh, including our group, is the origin of life essential elements in the bulk silicate fraction of rocky planets that includes the mantle, includes the crust, and includes the near surface ocean atmospheric systems. And this is essential, uh, the acquisition of these elements are essential both for the long-term climate as well as planetary habitab habitability and their evolution. So one in interesting observation that has emerged through lots of detailed geochemical study for our own planet is if you look at the abundance of carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and hydrogen in the bulk silicate fraction, including atmosphere, ocean, crust, and mantle, that these elements are not in carbonaceous chondrite abundance ratios. So carbon to nitrogen ratio is superchondritic, carbon to sulfur ratio is chondritic, and carbon to hydrogen ratio is subchondritic. What that immediately tells you that the delivery of carbonaceous chondritic material as a late accreting material after the core formation is complete, after the moon forming giant impact, you cannot explain the relative abundance of these elements into our Earth. So we need to think about their origin through the accretion process, through the planetary differentiation process. So the role of differentiation automatically becomes very important. The key parameters that we should be then looking at is how did these life essential volatile ingredients or elements fractionated or behave during magma ocean processes, during core formation, during uh, proto-atmosphere and magma ocean interactions. The key parameters then that would be important are things like how these elements were soluble in magma ocean, how these elements fractionated between the equilibrium metallic liquid that segregated to form the core and the overlying silicate magma ocean that eventually later crystallized to give this bulk silicate reservoirs that we are worried about. 
So in order to do that, including my group and many others in the community have been uh, delving into this uh, experimental com campaign over the last 10 years, figuring out the fractionation of these life essential volatile elements during core formation. So what I'm showing here are two plots where the carbon's metal affinity is compared with the sulfur's metal affinity as well as carbon's metal affinity compared to nitrogen's metal affinity. What the issue is here that all these volatile elements actually turn out to be siderophile. But more interestingly, carbon is more siderophile than sulfur and carbon is more siderophile than nitrogen under all sort of shallow upper mantle conditions where magma ocean uh, differentiation took place. So what that tells you is if you do equilibrium core formation, you cannot actually explain the subchondritic uh, or superchondritic carbon nitrogen ratio and chondritic carbon sulfur ratio. So what is the solution? To do that, uh, one of my current grad students, Daman Grewal, what he showed is if you actually look at that similar type of equilibrium core fractionation and how these elements are fractionated, if you do that for a sulfur-rich body or, or a planetary body that has a sulfur-rich core, you can actually flip the relative carbon sulfur and carbon nitrogen fractionation behavior. So in other words, if the proto-Earth as, as it was growing accreted a planetary embryo that has a sulfur-rich core, you might be able to actually establish that present-day relative abundance of carbon, nitrogen, sulfur that we see at the surficial layers of our planet, the non-metallic portion of our planet. Uh, so the proposition we gave is towards the late phase of accretion, but not as a late accreting material, if our proto-Earth actually merged with a differentiated planetary embryo that has a sulfur-rich core, that body could actually bring the bulk silicate portion of that planet with the right carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and hydrogen abundance patterns that actually we see at the present day planet of our, uh, that at the present day state of our planet. So in summary, what we are, beginning to learn through our experimental work that the silicate fractions and the near surface reservoirs of planetary bodies actually acquire very different budgets of carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and sulfur, depending on the conditions of accretion. The equilibrium core formation under reducing conditions depletes these elements in different uh, uh, ratios and abundances. And larger planets such as ours that actually grow by protracted uh, history through larger giant impacts and so on could attain these life essential volatile element budgets through mergers of different planetary embryos and planetary simuls. That actually opens doors for our thought process as we explore different exoplanetary worlds, whether or not they also have these life essential ingredients. And if so, do they have those ingredients in similar abundance pattern as of our current planet? Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajdeep. Next up, Laura Schaefer. Thank you. Good morning. I want to talk today about establishing the Earth's first atmosphere from an interior of the Earth perspective. If we look at the solar system, we have three planets that in their early history may have had habitable conditions on their surface. While Mars today is cold and dry, we know that there's abundant evidence for liquid water on its surface in its past. And while Venus today is very hot and also dry, recent climate simulations have suggested that Venus could have maintained liquid water on its surface for several billion years uh, early in its history. But in the present day, we know that at least one of these planets had the right conditions during its early history for life to originate Bob Hazen's vital worlds and also to thrive, and that is the Earth. But we know that there are now other places outside of the solar system to look for life. Astronomers in recent years have found more than 4,000 planets orbiting other stars. This is an artist's impression of what the Milky Way might look like if you had telescopes for eyes, with the planets exaggerated. Every star in the Milky Way might have a planet orbiting it. And 20% of the stars, like the sun, are likely to have a planet around the size of the Earth in the orbital period known as the habitable zone, where liquid water might be stable. 
But as Bob pointed out earlier, it's important not just to establish that a planet has currently habitable conditions, but also that it had the right conditions for the origin of life early in its history. Now, in order to know what those conditions were like, we have to look at the earliest atmospheres of the, of the Earth and the other planets. And for the Earth, that atmosphere started off with a bang. This is an artist's rendition of the giant moon forming impact. And it was this impact that really set the initial conditions from which the rest of the atmosphere system evolved. Um, this might not have been the only giant impact that the Earth experienced, but it was the last, and it reset the system uh, to evolve to what we have today. This is a uh, a model of the evolution of a canonical giant impact atmosphere and surface temperature. The, fig the graph shows the evolution from the time of the giant impact on the left going forward in time to the right. And you can see that the surface temperature starts off at conditions hot enough not just to vaporize the volatile elements, but also the the majority of the silicate mantle. And so the atmosphere at this time period was actually dominated by rock vapor. Um, as the planet cools off in, in only a few thousand years, the atmosphere is dominated by, in these models, the dominant uh, volatiles that we see on the Earth today, water and CO2. And they react to the evolution of the magma ocean system due to their solubility in the melt. And eventually the planet cools off to the point where we get liquid water condensing first into clouds and then into oceans. And when this happens, water and CO2 react with the early protocrust and draw down CO2 in a rapid chemical weathering phase. Now, these models, these previous models that I showed you, they assume that the gases coming out of the magma ocean have the same composition as those that we see coming out of volcanoes today. But many of the models for these early uh, differentiation processes, particularly core formation models, suggest that the oxidation state of the Earth's interior was much lower during this time than it is at the present, somewhere below the iron bustite buffer. Whereas today we have conditions more closer to the quartz phthalite magnetite buffer, about four to five log units above iron bustite. And the oxidation state of the interior of the planet is really governed by the behavior of iron in the magma ocean. Once the metal separates out into the core after the last episode of core formation, it's the relative abundances of iron 2 plus and 3 plus that set the oxidation state. And as the magma ocean is solidifying, those abundances are going to evolve as well because they do not partition into between melts and minerals in the same fashion. Uh, recent high-pressure silicate experiments have suggested that you could produce something like a few percent of iron 3 plus during the magma ocean phase, uh, similar to the abundances that we see in the upper mantle today. The figure on the left-hand sh side shows the evolution of the oxidation state and the gas composition at the surface for a planet that has 5% iron 3 plus at the upper end of what we see today. And that atmosphere is dominantly oxidized throughout its history. Whereas if you start with the low end, about 1%, the atmosphere starts off reduced with hydrogen and carbon monoxide dominating. And only at the end, as iron 3 plus becomes enriched, is it more oxidized. Uh, comparison to the deuterium to hydrogen ratio of the Earth and its close um, correspondence with that of carbonaceous chondrites suggests that the Earth could not have lost very much hydrogen uh, from this in-stage atmosphere. And so that l puts a lower bound on the oxygen fugacity of that late atmosphere. Um, and in work led by Cave Polyvon, we suggest that that lower limit is a little above the iron bosite buffer and could be approaching the present day. Although, as we'll hear from the next speaker, there is room for further evolution of that atmosphere. Um, observations of uh, uh, silicate material falling onto white dwarf stars suggest that um, material around other solar systems has similar compositions and similar oxidation states to what we see in the solar system. 
And so there is hope that we have enough information to model the compositions of these exoplanets and may be able to try to identify planets um, that would be right for the origins of life. Ladies and gentlemen, Sonja Albach. Um, good morning. Thank you also for this nice introduction. First of all, I want to start out by acknowledging colleagues with whom I've had been in discussion without implying that they will agree to everything I'm going to say here today. So when I talk about Earth inner values, I specifically mean the mantle redox stage, um, state, so oxygen fugacity, and the mantle potential temperature, the temperature of a mantle at the surface if it were able to decompress without partially melting. We can gauge oxygen fugacity in a variety of ways. We can look at the speciation or the partitioning of redox sensitive elements. So on the left, um, for example, you can see that ferric over total iron ratio uh, increases with increasing oxygen fugacity relative to the firelight magnetite quartz buffer in glasses. Uh, on the right, you can see that the bulk distribution coefficient of vanadium decreases, whereas that of scandium is indifferent because scandium does re possess redox chemistry. Similarly, there's a variety of ways in which we can estimate uh, mantle potential temperature from appropriate samples, and this has led to the recognition that the ambient mantle as sampled beneath spreading ridges um, has a lower potential temperatures than, for example, plume-derived mantle, which intersects the solidus then at appropriately greater depth. And so we can use these tools and apply them to convecting mantle samples through time. And when we do that, just for modern ambient mantle, you can see that there's a range of estimates just for the modern mantle amounting to a difference of at least one log unit oxygen fugacity. Similarly, mantle potential temperature estimates vary by at least 100 degrees. So this probably reflects in part true heterogeneity, but also maybe in part inappropriate samples, processes that have not been accounted for, and methodological bias. Now, imagine trying to take this back into time, but that shouldn't stop us. So we have an estimate for the modern morgue, which I've just talked about. We've heard that after core formation, the mantle was in equilibrium with metal, so very low oxygen fugacity and that after magma ocean crystallization, there's a range of possibilities, which then beg the question, was the mantle oxidized early or was there room for some evolution in mantle redox stage, state? And so some of us have um, assembled convecting mantle-derived um, sample suites from which we estimate oxygen fugacity. These have completely different petrogenesis and also a somewhat different approach. And what they both show is that there is an evolution across the Archean Proterozoic boundary, and there is lower redox state in the Archean. So what does this mean in terms of habitability? Well, it looks like the mantle transitioned from a state where volcanic gases um, would have consumed oxygen in the atmosphere to allowing the accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere. And this transitioning possibly coincides with what we see as the first whiffs of oxygen so that is exciting, but I think even more exciting is that there's actually room to have a more reducing Paleoarchean and Hadean mantle, which um, um, releases reducing gases into the atmosphere. And then there are processes w that help us make methane for, from these reduced gases, and that could help alleviate the faint young sun paradox, but also allow the synthesis of prebiotic organic molecules. So what about mantle potential temperature? Well, there's two curves out there right now, and you can see that there's a huge difference in the Archean and in other times for those estimates, which is really unfortunate because it makes a difference between having plate tectonics and having um, continental freeboard, so some emergence of the continents above sea level and not having it. So it's important to resolve that. And there are several recent estimates um, from completely different sample suites, also completely different approaches that seem to converge on this more benign or, or claimant mental potential temperature evolution curve, which is lower. And what that means is that for reasonable estimates of the continental area in the Archean, um, here in this orange field, we actually can have some continental freeboard. And what that means is 
that we can also have continental weathering. We can actually provide nutrients or wash nutrients into the oceans. We can increase the biomass, which we can then sequester by uh, organic carbon sequestration. We have more photosynthesis, which allows oxygen accumulation. And so all this would have had huge effects probably on biosphere evolution. And so while there are a lot of issues to resolve, I think these are exciting times and we should keep our minds open as to the possibilities of what the mantle can contribute to this discussion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Courtney Spray. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to make sure. OK, so for the last 40 minutes, the speakers in this session have talked a lot about the ingredients of life. And so the next obvious question is, what are the ingredients necessary to take life away? And this question is really pertinent in the modern world because due to anthropogenic forcing such as climate change, sea level rise, deforestation, and pollution, among other things, uh, we're threatening global ecosystem collapse. But luckily, we do not have to experience a mass extinction ourselves to answer this question. Um, since the Cambrian explosion roughly 541 million years ago, the proliferation of life has been interrupted by five major mass extinction events, where 50 to 96 percent of all species living on Earth went extinct. In general, these events have many things in common. First, they occur on geologically abrupt timescales, many of them occurring on a million years or less. Often, these events are associated with major shifts in climate, including global warming and also global cooling. And finally, four out of five of these events coincide with large-scale volcanism. However, we know that the Earth system is very complicated. And so these broad generalizations about mass extinctions are not giving us insight into the actual mechanisms by which ecosystems collapse. And therefore, to properly understand the causes of mass extinctions and in which ways these ancient events can give us insight into the modern world, we need to step back from these broad generalizations and look at these events in more detail. So what do we need to do to assess the causes of mass extinction events? First thing we need to do is we need to be able to tie our forcing mechanisms, such as large-scale volcanism or meteor impacts, to observe environmental change like climate change or ocean acidification, and ultimately tie these to records of extinction. And at a first pass, what we need to do is assess that these events are correlated in time, and also that the timing of proposed perturbations are short enough that they can result in ecosystem collapse. Luckily for us, in the last decade, there have been huge improvements in high-precision geochronology due to improved analytical techniques, in addition to new instrumentation that has really helped us see into some of, this, or some of these events. Uh, this greatly improved precision has allowed us to look at these events with precision levels on the order of 0.01 to 0.1%. Um, and so an example of what this improved precision has allowed us to do, this is an example from my own work looking at the end Cretaceous mass extinction. Using argon-argon geochronology, we were able to determine that in general, we see that the onset of terrestrial decline before the mass extinction event is similar in time to the onset of late Cretaceous climate change and also similar in time to the onset of Deccan volcanism. What we also see is that this prolonged recovery from this mass extinction event seems to also be correlate, or correlated in time with the prolonged um, eruption of Deccan volcanism after the mass extinction event, ultimately suggesting that the Deccan traps did play a role in the mass extinction and the subsequent recovery, and that it was a meteor impact and volcanism that probably led to the death of the dinosaurs. However, this precision is not enough. Many really key elements in the Earth system, their response timescales are much, much smaller than what is resolvable with high-precision geochronology, uh, such as response timescales for vegetation, for the ocean, and then also, in general, for the carbon cycle. Luckily, we do have some new techniques that are being developed that are starting to resolve these smaller timescales. Two examples of these techniques include paleosecular variation and also mercury proxy, or proxy records. And using these techniques in combination with high precision geochronology, we're starting now to resolve timescales that are kind of on the order of modern climate change. 
And so ultimately, by using these techniques, uh, we're starting to be able to use our insight from ancient events to say something about modern ecosystem change, helping lead us away from what may be the next mass extinction. Thank you. So can we first uh, thank our speakers today before we start our questions? And there's, can I take any questions for any of the panel members? Otherwise, I'll have to ask questions. Just want to. When we think about the Earth system, oh, thanks. When thinking about the Earth system, it would seem as if because the mantle has so much mass of the planet, would we then think that it should be a significant driver of controlling conditions, especially when you talked about redox conditions of the planet? Should that be a really fundamental discussion point before we can move forward? And maybe your nodding is already indicating that you, of course, believe that to start with. I'm totally in favor of that, of course. But I'm not the one who even uh, thought this up. This has been known for decades now, or well, suggested a long time ago, that the mantle has a role, especially its redox via the release of gases. And so early on, it was thought that the early mantle was reducing, which could give rise to a reducing atmosphere, which then would allow prebiotic uh, molecules to be synthesized. And then there was uh, later uh, several works showing uh, that apparently there was no evolution in the mantle redox state since at least 3.8 years ago, billion years ago. And so that led people away from discussing a role of the mantle. But I think. Um, when you, when you assemble carefully um, sample suites, the, the petrogenesis of which you understand, then you, then you can finally sort out a signal. You can see a signal where before, when people just look at large databases, they weren't able to see one. And I think that's the difference between the curve that I've shown you and those that are out in the literature. So yes, I think there is a role, and, uh, and I'm not even, um, which has put some points in there. It's been suggested much earlier that there should be a role of the mantle. So do we think the mantle has evolved over time to change the parameters from origin to sustaining life, or that it was kind of set in his state? No, I think it evolved. And actually, a model that's very popular, well, a model that is being discussed is that when we had um, equilibrium between the metal core, when we had core formation, that initial redox state was very low. And then um, when, you, when you separate iron, ferrous iron, um, when, when you have that in the lower mantle, it disproportionates and you separate the metal into the core and you leave a lower mantle that is more oxidizing. So people have modeled that numerically, they've demonstrated it experimentally. So you have this oxidizing post-core formation lower mantle. And the question then becomes how rapidly it became mixed with the upper mantle. I think based on the evidence, I see that the mixing time was prolonged. Okay, we also see that from radiogenic isotope systems or maybe even mirroring that the downward mixing of a late veneer. Um, and um, so the question is um, whether we can support our initial observations with, with, with more data, more samples, basically. But yes, I think there was an evolution and it makes sense from a, from a physical point of view, from experiments and theoretical um, considerations. And Kanani, we have time for one last question. Uh, Laura, uh, is it possible that there would be evidence remaining on Venus of very early life? Should we send a mission to Venus and look for it? <laughs> uh, that would be fantastic. It does seem that most of the surface of Venus is relatively young, probably post-dating any possible uh, water on the surface. Um, there is evidence um, of some small terrains on Venus that are substantially older, and going to those terrains uh, might provide some evidence that there might have been water on the surface at some point. Uh, whether you could preserve evidence of life, I'm not sure. I think you'd have to ask an astrobiologist. 
Fantastic. So this afternoon, we will be continuing our exploration of habitability from the viewpoint of the interior of the Earth, talking more about uh, volcanic hazards and uh, seismic hazards and uh, resources and so forth. So uh, thank you all for uh, sharing with us this morning, and thank you to the panel once again.